display your likeness. Chief from glory to glory, mirrored here, may our lives tell your story. Shine on me. Shine. Grace to you and peace from God our Father, from our Lord and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. We just sung that song this past Wednesday for our midweek class, so that should be pretty familiar. When I was at the 2001 National Youth Gathering, Reverend Dr. John Nunes took his Bible. We were in New Orleans, and he went like this. And he said, can you hear it? Can you hear God's word speaking? Of course we can. We open it, we read it, we understand it. So today we hear our God speaking to us through his word. In Mark chapter 9, verse 8, And suddenly, looking around, they no longer saw anyone with them but Jesus only. This is our text. Jesus only. This is the picture we get on the Mount of Transfiguration. As we think about our text today, we hear God speaking to us through his word. And I think about that word and how some view the word of God and how they understand and interpret that word. And I want to point out a very serious but subtle mistake that can happen when we look at the word of God. When we understand this word of God, sometimes we might be tempted to think, yeah, it's God's voice, but man wrote it. Therefore, maybe man has some voice in it. Maybe God isn't fully present in the Word. Some might say that the Bible simply contains God's Word and isn't really God's Word. It isn't the holy, inspired, inerrant Word of God. Dear saints of Christ, here at Faith Lutheran, the Bible doesn't simply contain God's Word, but it is. God's word. That's what you and I believe. That's what we stand on as our confession of faith, that the Bible is the holy, inerrant, inspired word of God, breathed by the Holy Spirit to the writers. These writers were kings, shepherds, apostles, disciples, farmers, a variety of God's people. He brought the word through them by way of the Holy Spirit. Now this Bible, it's One that I have, you have your Bible at home, maybe like the King James Version, maybe like the New International Version, ESV Version. Whatever Bible you use, it's a lamp to our feet and a light to our path, as Psalm 119, 105 says. This Word of God is a a guide for our soul. It's an anchor for us, as Hebrews 6 says. It's, It's what points us to the saving work of God through Jesus Christ. It's God's Word for you. It's trustworthy, it's true, it's a proclamation of his forgiveness and his grace through Jesus Christ. The Bible is what God gives to his people. It's law and it's gospel. So what does that have to do with today? What does the Bible and God's word being holy and inerrant and inspired have to do with anything of the transfiguration of our Lord? This final Sunday after Epiphany, the most wonderful and glorious display of of Jesus' glory in all of Scripture. Well, there's a great tie-in to Christmas. There's a great tie-in from the transfiguration to the Christmas story. In John 1.14, and the Word became flesh, the Word of God became flesh and dwelt among us. We have seen His glory. Glory as of the one and only from the Father, full of grace and truth. Jesus is the Word personified, the Word made flesh. We go back to the Word. We go back to the very beginning, this Word present at creation. 
One of my professors at a seminary once told me, don't talk about Genesis so much. The people of God get Genesis to death. But I'm going to talk about Genesis. I'm going to go back to the creation. It's important. It's pivotal. It's essential. God's word is present. The Logos, Jesus is the word made flesh. He is present even from the very beginning. You take Jesus out of the word, you take him out of creation, you aren't left with much of anything. The Bible doesn't simply contain God's word. The Bible is God's word. Genesis gives us God's word in all its purity and truth. And if, which I hope you do, come to the Bible study this morning at 9.30, 9.45, we'll talk about creation. We'll talk about this beginning narrative. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and God said, let there be light. And at 186,000 miles per second, light came screaming out of the mouth of God. And there was light. Incredible. God's word made light. The majestic, the majestic voice of God not only called light into existence, but land, animals, creatures. He did all of that. Vegetation. And once all was created, God did not go silent. God continued to speak. He said, let us, God saying this, make man in our image. What's good about this is that God is already using Trinitarian language, even in the beginning at Genesis chapter 1. Some would say, well, God's talking from the perspective of him and the angels. No, he's not. Verse 27 says, so God created man in his image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. God wasn't done speaking. This God continues to speak in Genesis 1. He says, it is not good that man should be alone. I will make a helper fit for him. Ladies, your turn. I get to preach to you this morning. How incredible that God thought to give you a distinct purpose. To create females to be complementary to males. That men would not fully know who they were unless they peered into the face of a female. That the differences that men and women have are gifts from God. That men would know the fullness of their self by looking at woman. Woman taken from man. Interesting. What do you think Adam was doing when he was naming the animals? This one and this one and giraffe and elephant and hippo. He was looking for a helper, a spouse, but it says none was suitable for him until God gets his hands dirty. A second time, God gets his hands dirty, creates Adam from the dust, and then he gets his hands dirty and takes the rib from Adam and creates Eve. Ladies, you're not a man, and thank goodness you're not a man. You have a distinct, different, and and quite honestly, our culture should celebrate that instead of trying to remove those differences. God created Eve to be a helpmeet to Adam. Not a slave, not a robot, not a doormat, not a second-class citizen. God created Adam and Eve to be husband and wife, to gain the respect, love, and attention of her husband, to be a central figure in the household, Eve, to be the bringer of life into the family, to be the one who gives life. And this is the reason that God said, a man shall leave his husband and mother and father, a man shall leave his mother and father and hold fast to his wife. This is God's design. God spoke it. This is what God decreed from heaven, that a man should not die for a a stapler or a flower pot or his pickup truck, but he would die for his wife. That's the picture of love God has for husband and wife. Guys, if that's what the situation calls for, you to lay down your, your life for your wife, that's what you do. Whether it's someone pointing a pistol at your wife, you step in front, you push her out of the way, you are the one who is called to give up your life for your wife. This is the vow you make in Ephesians 4.25. What's Ephesians 4.25? 
Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. It's a love unto death, up to death and even through death. That's what your marriage calls for. You love your wife. God's created order. Adam, then Eve. The two become one, and God saw that it was not only good, but very good. Then God said to the newly created couple, You may surely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat. For in the day that you eat of it, you shall surely die. So God speaks life. God brings creation into existence, and then God gives a command. God says to the first couple, do not eat of this one tree of the garden. Death is an anomaly. Death is so unnatural to God's creation. It's not what was intended. It's not part of the created order. God's perfect creation, his perfect Eden, did not include death. Just think, what a place Pierce, South Dakota would be if there was no death. If this was the one place in the planet that didn't have any death uh, infiltrate its ranks, you'd have so many people here, it'd be unbelievable. Pierce, South Dakota would not be able to handle everyone from all over the world that would flock to this place. You might even get a Target and a Coles here if that were the case. <laughs> death. It's even in Pierce. It strikes our families. It strikes our friendships. It strikes the ones we love. It takes people too soon from us. Death is an enemy. It's an intruder. It's an invader into God's perfect creation. And we know that in Adam, all die. You must be in the way of Adam. Because not you, nor I, or anyone is getting out of this thing alive. Unless Jesus returns before the day the Lord calls us home. The wages of our sin is death. It's what we owe for the sin we've committed against God. St. Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15 that the last enemy to be destroyed is death. God's thunderous decree from heaven says that Adam and Eve failed to listen and they were persuaded by another voice. Do you start to see the connection of the transfiguration to the beginning of creation? Voice from heaven. God dec decreeing this is what it takes. The glory, the command. This is God's will. But there are voices, aren't there? There are other voices. We have voices that cause us to fail to listen to Jesus only. And all these other voices lead to death. Their way is a way of death. How many other voices do you have spoken to you throughout the week? From the news racks at the, at the grocery store to the commentators on the, and the newscasters on TV internet, you have your inner circles, you have songwriters and YouTubers and bloggers and atheists and pastors and, and um, doctors. You have all these voices coming at you, some good, some bad. How do you discern which voice is of God? How do you discern what voice to listen to? You go back to the Word of God. You go back to God's word. You understand that the voice of God speaks in such a way. It's kind of difficult sometimes because the, the voice of the devil sounds an awful lot like God, doesn't it? It sounds like God. The devil takes his lie and he sandwiches it in between two truths. It looks pretty edible, but inside it's rotten to the core. How do you discern that? How do you discern which way you should go? Go back to the Word of God. Go back to Jesus only. Read God's Word. Mark it. Learn it. Inwardly digest it. Study it. In the Mark text for today, God the Father himself tells us to do just that. Go back to the Word of God. The Word of truth. It's a divine imperative in the Mark text. God says, this is my beloved Son, Listen to him. A, a, an imperative is a command. Basically, when you're translating, you come across an imperative. Oh, it's a command. Do this. Listen. It's a command. God wants us to listen to Jesus. And not only do this, but it can be translated, continue without ceasing to listen to him. 
do this and continually do this. Wow. Not just one hour a week, but continually. Go back to the Word of God. Listen daily to God and His Word. Listen to Jesus and only Jesus and continually listen to Jesus in your marriage. Listen to God's word for you through Jesus. In your choices, listen to God's word for you through Jesus. In your going to church, in your daily prayer, in your meditation, listen to God's word for you through Jesus. Maybe your prayer this week is, Holy Spirit, help me to listen to Jesus and to continually listen to him. It's not easy to do with so many voices competing for your attention, is it? Jesus is the greater Moses. He's the greater Elijah. And in our our text today, it says that John the Baptist is the Elijah who was to come. And this Elijah, this John the Baptist, too suffered. And we know that Jesus calls his people to suffer, and Jesus himself suffers. That's not a message we want to listen to, is it? Peter didn't want to listen to that message. Peter didn't want to understand what Jesus was telling him. No, no, Jesus, let's stay up on the mountain. Let's bask in your glory. Let's just hang out with Moses and Elijah. I'll build some huts, three of them, as a matter of fact. Let's put you on equal footing with the prophets. No, Peter, you don't understand. I must go down to the plains and I must suffer. I must die. I must give my life on a cross. Will you take up your cross and follow him? Will you give yourself fully to the work and mission of Jesus, even if it causes you to suffer? We don't like that. We don't like that talk. No talk of suffering. We call that chasing a theology of glory. When you take the glory off of God and you try to put it on yourself, God, not your way, not the way of the cross, not the way of suffering. I want the way of glory. That's not God's way. The theology of glory. We'd rather have that than embrace in embracing a theology of the cross. Jesus teaches us to embrace the theology of the cross. It's a way we pursue that leads to God's glory. When we pursue the theology of the the cross, it's not our good works. It's what God has done for us. It's his way that is beyond our way. It's a way that suffers the way of the cross for our justification. The theology of the cross. Don't like it? (laughs) Go find a new religion. There are plenty out there. They all preach wealth, health, and prosperity, don't they? but they won't bring you to the Easter tomb. They won't bring you to the bodily resurrection. They won't bring you to the hope and guarantee you have written in the blood of Jesus Christ on the cross. Listen to Jesus. Listen to Jesus only. It's his voice that makes this claim. I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me will live even though he dies. Talk about something that peer needs. Talk about something that you and I need, a voice of authority, a voice of authority over death. That's the voice we want to listen to. It's the voice that commands the forces of death. Oprah doesn't have authority over death. Buddha doesn't have authority over death. Muhammad, Darwin, you and I, we don't have authority over death. The only one who does is Jesus. The Old Testament prophets, Moses and Elijah, pointed to the greater voice of authority. They pointed to Jesus so that by the end of the account today, they fade away and all we're left with is Jesus only. It's only him. This is the one who will die and rise for you, for Adam and Eve and for their transgression and for you and mine. And in this holy word of God, God's voice comes through. Through your pastors, God's voice comes through. God's words are spoken through him. And in due time, in the days ahead, God will bring you a new pastor who will share to you the voice of God through his word, through preaching and teaching of holy scripture. The voice of God comes through. 
through Holy Communion, you taste God's glory given to you in Christ Jesus, given to you to appease the wrath of God. On the cross of Christ, we hear a voice that comes through loud and clear. The voice of your Savior says, it is finished. The work of the prophets, the work of fulfilling the law, it is finished. For you and for me, it's finished. So strip everything else away today. Take it away and you are left with Jesus only. Lift high the cross. The love of Christ proclaim. So all the world adore his sacred name. But we're not done this morning. The story continues this week as we go from the Mount of Transfiguration to the plains of Lent. We journey with Jesus toward the cross. So we'll see you Ash Wednesday at 7 as we journey toward the cross, as we gain another opportunity to listen to Jesus and to follow the divine imperative. Listen to Jesus and continually listen to him. Amen. Now may the peace of God which passes all understanding guard our hearts and our minds in Jesus. Amen. We would stand at this time, make bold confession of our faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed, found printed on the back cover of your hymnal.